Hey everyone, welcome to BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book Podcast. I'm Tilly. I'm Nikki. And I'm Kelly. This week we're talking about a classic, The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman, which was first published in 1995. Some discussion trigger warnings as this book has some pretty dark themes, including child abuse and human trafficking. Here's the publisher's synopsis from Kelly. Lyra is rushing to the cold, far north, where witch clans and armored bears rule. North, where the gobblers take the children they steal, including her friend Roger. North, where her fearsome uncle Asriel is trying to build a bridge to a parallel world. Can one small girl make a difference in such great and terrible endeavors? This is Lyra, a savage, a schemer, a liar, and as fierce and true a champion as Roger or Asriel could want. But what Lyra doesn't know is that to help one of them will be to betray the other. Great, and uh, Nikki's going to introduce the drink we've chosen to pair with this book. Today we chose a drink that matches the winter vibes of the North, a polar bear hot chocolate. It's made with milk, sugar, dark chocolate, Baileys, peppermint schnapps, and whipped cream. This drink also made us think of the chocolatel Lyra drinks in the book, and the powerful Panzersbjorn, or armored bears. Great. Can't wait to take a sip. I forgot the whipped cream, but I'm sure it'll still be delicious. (laughs) And for anyone listening who doesn't like mint, like me, (laughs) um, I just didn't put it in. Great. Great. So let's go. What a lovely substitution. (laughs) Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. Oh. Oh, heck yeah. Oh, so good. I don't drink coffee, but I would drink this every morning. I might get into trouble <laughs> if we do every morning. <laughs> Help me get me through the day. Oh my gosh, it's so rich. Maybe I put too much sugar. Uh oh. And like, no, there's never too much sugar. We're good. <laughs> It like cooled down just the right amount while I was waiting to take the first sip. And it's so, it's like a warm blanket. It's so good. (laughs) Wow. It's so good. Kelly, you can't really even taste the mint. Well, I beg to differ. I will root that mint out. Okay. (laughs) Mm. If it's not a mint in my mouth, I don't want mint in other things. Okay. So, (laughs) or toothpaste, I guess. All right. Noted. (laughs) Great. So we're all going to give our star ratings out of five with kind of some explanations and our background of reading. Now, we all have our different ways of rating books and explaining why. So we're going to just go ahead and do that for you. Nikki, do you want to start us off? So I gave this book a five out of five. I hadn't read it before. And I was honestly a little skeptical going into it because I was like, oh, this is a really beloved kids book. And what if I don't like it? Or maybe I'm past my prime for reading this kind of literature. I don't know. But honestly, reading through the book, especially at the end, I was really surprised and was thinking, this is not for children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the theology and Mm -hmm. the... So I, I grew up Roman Catholic. I'm not necessarily... I don't go to church or anything like that anymore. And I didn't have a problem with the stuff that was being said in the book, but it was a lot more direct than a lot of other books that I've read that question the church to the point where I was almost like it was a little brass at points, but I was like, ooh. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. I was just really surprised by those things, especially because the book is for kids. Or originally yeah. targeted at younger audiences, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe I'll jump in now, too, because I've actually read this book probably about four or five times now. Uh, it was one of my all-time favorites as a kid. And every time I... Yeah, every time I reread it, it still holds up because the ideas are so complicated. So I find it's really good for a reread, even as an adult. Um, This is a five out of five star book for me. I love the whole series. The third book in this series is the first book I can ever remember kind of emotionally devastating me. As a child, I remember weeping. Um, A a, a common practice in my reading life now. (laughs) So I, yeah, I just, I really love this book. Everything that happens in it has a really special place in my heart. I think it kind of formed a lot of my ideas growing up. And I really love Lyra as a character. Um, I didn't grow up going to church, and so these were a lot of like new ideas for me. 
Um, and I think it's really important to have kind of all perspectives. And I think we're probably going to talk about this a little bit more in the discussion, but uh, I love reading all kinds of books that have all kinds of perspectives. So this one, for me, is just really, really wonderful. Cool. <laughs> Um, I had a little different experience. I still enjoyed it overall, but my rating was a three and a half out of five. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought some parts worked really well for me and other parts I was kind of like, okay, dot, 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 interesting. Um, I don't know if I will finish the series. That's just me being honest. I don't know. I did enjoy it. I really liked the action scenes and how he wrote the action scenes I thought they were very um like intense and fast paced and especially I spent most of my uh experience with this book listening to it and it was done as a radio play and it was really well done so it was so the, good it was really good um the action scenes were like oh my god listening to it and I would like listen and read it at the same time to follow along and so I really liked that. The ending, I was kind of like, okay, I totally get this. However, it's like what Nikki said. I was like, this is not for kids. Like, this is like a lot. And I think if I had read this book as a kid, I would have had a panic attack. Like, honestly, just me personally. Um, I didn't go to church growing up. have nothing against it. But I don't really read a lot of things with theological elements, I guess. Or like... Um, like uh, is the word advertly like where it's like this is for sure about this like this is not like i don't know where it was very much like in your face intense which is fine oh yeah there um, it wasn't like a hidden meeting no, you could definitely no. tell there was no. he didn't try to hide the similarities between the catholic church and the, the or like christian yeah. belief systems and the magisterium he literally took passages from the yeah. bible from the first testament and just added little extra tidbits to relate it to dust essentially yeah. <laughs> yeah so and before we got to the end i remember feeling like okay dude we get it you didn't like narnia you know like this is like <laughs> his secular response i read which mm -hmm. is fine but i just thought like if it, I mean, if a kid was reading it, they wouldn't have gotten like, oh, this is very clearly this, 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 this. But as an adult right. reading it, I was like, okay, we get it, you know? Um, so overall, I did enjoy it. I fell in love with a few of the characters. But I right now, I don't know if I want to finish the series or not. It's not... I don't know. It's not like... I'm not dying to read the rest of it, but I, I wouldn't say I would never read the rest of it. I'm just kind of on the fence about that. But three, to, three and a half out of five from me. Great. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I mean, um, this book was pretty controversial when it came out, and I think it remains controversial to this day. I think it's been banned in a lot of mm. schools and a lot of places because it has such strong opinions. Mm. Um, so that definitely makes sense to me that people would have kind of strong opinions about this strong opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, as a kid, um, I definitely didn't pick up on any of that going on. I was just really in love with the magic and the the demons and the like alethiometer and the, the science, kind of pseudo magical science of it all and the characters. And then it's really once you read it as an adult that you get to see all these extra elements and extra layers, which only become more um, apparent and more kind of delved into and developed into the, the rest of the series. Mm. See, I feel like if I had more of a background of knowing and understanding the Bible, I guess, maybe I could get into it more because it would be more of a debate for me to read versus like, mm. I have, all I know is from musicals, basically. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so I know Adam and Eve, you know, that's whatever. So I, I, it didn't get too like, huh, for me. But, like, when I watched The Da Vinci Code, I was like, I thought this was about art. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I had no idea. I was like, what? So, I don't know. But, yeah, definitely interesting, yeah. you know? I, de I definitely, like, think we should talk about it more. I have I have mm -hmm. things to say, um, and it will be interesting because I did go to church and both of you don't have a background in that, so I can give a little bit of a different perspective of reading the book. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to get too much of, into it before we get into spoilers, just in case, because I'm sure we'll blab about things that people don't <laughs> want to know in terms of plot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
So maybe let's um, dial it back a bit and talk some more about kind of the, the more traditional elements of the book. So maybe like we can talk about the world and the characters and the genre and things like that. Does anyone want to jump in? Sure. I was a little confused at first. So when I read the first six chapters or so, I looked up Cliff's Notes to read a summary because mm. I think honestly full disclosure when i started reading the book i was a little tired so i couldn't like obtain the information so i was like wait a sec i gotta go read a cliff's notes of what i just read and then i was mm-hmm. fine because i was like what because it you start right in the action which is totally mm-hmm. fine you know but i was like wait wait for me lyra like i don't know what's happening <laughs> so, but I yeah thought it was very well developed the world yeah, I had a kind of a similar experience. I started the audiobook and listened to probably like five minutes of it and was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> I had messaged Kelly and I was like, I was like, are you, I don't know if I said, are you listening to the audiobook? But we were talking about the audiobook and I said, are you listening to the one with the girl? And she said, no, I'm <laughs> listening to the full cast. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I mean. I just didn't make it far enough to hear anybody else other than Lyra talk. Oh. And so I stopped, read the first four chapters, and then started the audiobook. And then I felt a lot better because I felt like reading it, I was able to take in a lot more of the information. Mm-hmm. But wow, I just loved almost everybody. I know. In it. And <laughs> immediately was really connected to the relationship that Lyra and Pantalaimon had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just how sweet that was. And I really yeah. liked this idea of everybody having kind of a familiar or they call them demons in this. Mm-hmm. Um, having a an animal kind of other half to you or a sidekick to be with you and be your partner in life. And I love that. I thought that was really sweet. And it mm-hmm. added um, an extra layer of tenderness and caring to the story with all Mm -hmm. of this extra um, turmoil around it. And I thought that was a really nice layer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I totally understand why you two would um, be a little confused starting out because it really does just throw you right into the action. No explainer, no primer, no nothing. You have to kind of figure it out as you go. Mm -hmm. It's funny upon this reread, um, I probably did a reread about a year, maybe a couple of years ago. So it was still pretty fresh in my mind, but I was reading it thinking, oh my god, what if Nikki and Kelly just hate it? <laughs> because I had gone in so excited to share this with you two as a book that I really loved as a kid and that I that still holds like a really special place in my heart. So I was reading it like extra critically because I was like trying to prepare myself for anything that you guys would hate, which is absolutely totally fine. Um, but it just makes me happy to know that you love the characters and that you were kind of emotionally invested in the world because I think it's I think it's one of the best like fantasy world building examples that I can think of mm-hmm. and I love that it's not quite our own world like there are so many similar elements it really is kind of that parallel world where it just feels to me like okay this is going to go really really off the rails here but they talk uh I was reading about string theory <laughs> very vaguely so th- I, I I don't know enough to really talk about it really except that I know it has to do with there being parallel worlds and I think it has to do with choices and now that I'm saying this I'm wondering if maybe I'm even qualified to talk about this <laughs> but the way that I'm interpreting this world and the way that I am imagining it in my head is if one choice happened and two different worlds split off so one of them is our world and one of them is Lyra's Oxford because there are so many little nods that are just not quite ours. Like at one point when they're down in the crypts, they see um, the skeletons of the old scholars and Lyra says, oh, that part's in Roman, Mm -hmm. when really in our world we would call it Latin. So Mm -hmm. it's almost as if there was this this slight choice in history that made Lyra's Oxford rather than our world. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but this is how I'm interpreting it. And there were so many little things like that, like they called... Um, not electricity, but it's like anbaric power, Mm -hmm. where they call science experimental theology, because in their world, the church and science are not fundamentally opposed. They're kind of interconnected, but still um, kind of at war with each other. So I just really love this world. It's a world that I think about all the time and had a really big impact on me as a kid. So I'm just so excited to be talking about it. (laughs) I thought there were a couple parts in the book where 
Philip Pullman really got into the head of what it's like to be a kid. Um, yes. I really, I really enjoyed the part near the beginning where Lyra was talking about how all the different colleges had like wars every year, like two yeah. wars. And I was, I was reading it thinking, wait, like a real war or like a kid war? And I was like, no, 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 Kelly, like play fighting. <laughs> And I was, because it was just, the way it was written was so serious. And it would be serious for the yes. kid, you know, and be like, oh, we don't like them. We don't like them. But if those people come by, we all don't like them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Which I just thought was really funny because we do, we do that, you know, we really do. Especially as kids, we, we have this crazy imagination, right? So I really enjoyed some of those moments. Yeah. I didn't even think about um, relating this book to the Chronicles of Narnia at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a huge fan of um, the Chronicles of Narnia when I was a kid. And I remember reading um, The Last Battle and it totally destroying everything that I had ever thought about life. Um, (laughs) I was so upset and I still think about that book and get upset sometimes because it was like, I cannot believe you just made me read six books and then that is what you slapped me with at the end. It was crazy. But... Now, like, just thinking about that the last, like, few minutes while we were all talking, this is the the same kind of level of pure, I don't know, like, writing extravagance as yes. Narnia, and it totally lives up to that. I'm going to start the second book tonight, actually, because oh, I don't want so to exciting. stop. <laughs> Yay! Oh, I love hearing that. Yeah, it's definitely been compared a lot to the Chronicles of Narnia. I also read that series as a kid, also loved it. Didn't really occur to me that they were kind of similar in a lot of ways. But um, obviously, as we've kind of talked about a bit, the main difference is that um, C.S. Lewis was a devout Christian, and so all of his series kind of directly parallels Christian allegories, and there's a lot of um, direct kind of references to Bible stories and all that stuff, while Pullman is, excuse me, while Philip Pullman is an atheist, and he challenges his views on kind of organized religion in his Dark Materials, which is the the name of this whole series, The Golden Compass and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously they both feature British children, there's talking animals, there's an Arctic setting, especially in the first one, uh, in, in um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And then there's this kind of battle between good and evil. Mm-hmm. So I think these two series have been compared a lot, and I think they do kind of stand on a similar level. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, and I, I I don't have a good point. I just fall, I fall apart there. <laughs> I think it's uh, really interesting to to think about this book being secular, Mm -hmm. Um, because I don't feel that way necessarily because (laughs) while he, he disagreed with, um, Catholic or Christian views, the whole book still revolves around those views and people will take what they want to take from a book, you know? So if he really wanted it to be secular, I think it might have missed the mark in some ways. I don't care about that necessarily, whether people think it's secular or non-secular or whatever, but I just thought that was a really interesting point. (laughs) Yeah, I totally agree. I was going to bring that up at some point because I kept thinking like, it's like when women write a show about feminism, but it's only about the men kind of thing of like how, and like they don't, it doesn't like lift up the women. It's just about that. It's like, okay, but but wait a sec, you know, like, (laughs) so you're writing something that's supposed to be not that, but yet everything centers around the church and like the church in that, in their world. Right. So yeah. And there's pagans in there, you know, there's witches and stuff, but yeah, I was like, Hmm, interesting, interesting. But (laughs) well, it's interesting that you guys are talking about because I was just on Philip Pullman's Goodreads site (laughs) earlier today. (laughs) And the top thing in his biography is a quote, As a passionate believer in the democracy of reading, I don't think it's the task of the author of a book to tell the reader what it means. The meaning of a story emerges in the meeting between the words on the page and the thoughts in the reader's mind. So when people ask me what I meant in the story, or what was the message I was trying to convey in that one, I have to explain that I'm not going to explain. 
Anyway, I'm not in the message business. I'm in the once upon a time business, which I think is such a refreshing stance for an author to have it be, I'm not going to tell you what my story means. It really is up to your interpretation because every person who reads it is going to have a different experience. Mm -hmm. And I just, I really love Philip Pullman and I love that idea. Yeah. And I think that, um, that kind of quote from him is kind of, tying back to C.S. Lewis and Mm -hmm. Narnia, even though he would probably hate that. Um, It really shows how classic he is, not only in his writing, but just as a person, because I feel Mm -hmm. like that was really the true root of storytelling, was for people to take what they wanted from things. And that has been contorted a lot, especially, I think, now when there are there are so many um, different things happening in the world and everybody wants to be correct about everything and say the right thing all the time and all of these messages are getting misconstrued. Um, and But it's it's a story, you know, and you take from that what you want and you like it or you don't like it. Mm-hmm. And I think especially for authors, but for everybody, that's something that everybody needs to keep in mind is that it's not your responsibility to make people think a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. And no matter how much you try, they might still not, right? All you can do is control kind of your own behavior. And I think um, someone says that to Lyra in the book. I forget who it is, but they talk about how you can't really control what someone else thinks. All you can do is control what you do. Mm Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, why don't we get into some book recommendations? I have a couple, and um, it sounds like Nikki has a couple, too, maybe? Yeah, so the series that I'm going to recommend is the Pendragon series by DJ McHale. Um, While these don't necessarily have... um, I don't know how to explain it. I... They feel similar to me from the feeling I get from reading them. So Pendragon is about a boy named Bobby Pendragon whose uncle shows up one day and he is swept into this tunnel called a flume into Mm -hmm. another world. And he finds out that he is uh, basically a protector of all of these worlds. There's 10 different worlds and they make up a whole universe or system of planets called Hala. And they're trying to protect all of these planets from this evil guy named Saint Dane. Mm -hmm. And this just reminded me so much of that, like a kid being Mm -hmm. swept off onto this adventure and you're learning everything about it as they are. Right. And because all through this book, I mean, I felt like I went up to almost the very last second being like, I still don't know what dust is. (laughs) Sure, because Lyra didn't. Yeah, exactly. And that's how the Pendragon books made me feel. You're learning stuff constantly with the character. And I felt like that Mm -hmm. was or is a really good way to take somebody through a story. And that's another series that does it very well. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. I I read those books probably around the same time that I first read The Golden Compass. And I love them as well. So that's a a great one. Sorry, my, the milk. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I have a couple, and we already talked about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but I do see them as kind of parallels, and I think they're still interesting to read both um, the series and the Chronicles of Narnia. So as we kind of mentioned before, the first one, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis also takes place in kind of an Arctic other world, and there's a bunch of children who are trying to figure out what's going on on and there's all these talking animals and I mean if you haven't read the Chronicles of Narnia or you don't know what I'm talking about then um, maybe go look it up but I feel like everyone's pretty (laughs) familiar with it at this point so that would be the first recommendation I do kind of feel like there are parallels to each other and I would recommend um, getting both both stories because they're both really great uh, works of literature Um, So for another one that's uh, an adult book, this is a bit more of a leap, um, but I I stand by it. I feel like if you like The Golden Compass, you would also like this adult book, Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell. He's another British author who writes about scientific and sociopolitical issues juxtaposed with theology. 
So Cloud Atlas is for adults, but it also has the same kind of um, like genre bending sci-fi fantasy contemporary feel. Uh, and it also has a similar depth to the writing and a complicated plot and just a really incredible structure of interlocking narratives. Um, that's another one of my all-time favorite books. And so in my mind, uh, they kind of go together. I hear the movie's not very good, though. So if you have seen the movie and didn't like it, don't judge the book. <laughs> oh, t- uh, Tom Hanks is in it, right? Yeah. I think they made some weird casting choices from what I can tell. But the book is really wonderful. So I would recommend that. I love Tom Hanks. <laughs> Me too. Why is he He's in my that? husband? <laughs> he, I want him to be my uncle. I think he'd be the best uncle, personally. Anyways, he would be a no. good uncle. Uncle Tom? No. No, scratch that. <laughs> I was like, just immediately went to Uncle Tom's cabin, and I'm like, I don't think that's where she's going with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I take that back. Scratch that. <laughs> Edit it out. <laughs> oh, oh, love it. All right. Um, So now that we've gotten our book recommendations uh, out into the world, I think we should be moving into some spoilers territory. So if you haven't read the book, first of all, what are you doing listening to us? We've spent 29 minutes talking about this already. Um, But if you haven't read the book and you don't want to know how it all turns out, you should probably stop listening now. And uh, hey, if you like what you're hearing, feel free to leave us a rating or review on your podcast app of choice. We would really appreciate it. And if you'd like to support us in another way, uh, we recently launched a coffee, which is an app where you can uh, send a couple bucks our way if you like what we're doing. So we'll link that uh, in the description. And thank you so much. So if you don't want any spoilers, you should probably leave now. Yeah, Bye. get out of here. <laughs> okay, they're gone. Everybody ready? We'll begin with a quick recap of the rest of the book so we're all on the same page. Okay, so as we know from the synopsis that I read earlier, this book follows 11-year-old Lyra Balakwa, who was raised half-wild in Jordan College in Oxford in a parallel fantasy world. In Lyra's world, every human has a demon, an animal companion who is the embodiment of their soul. Children's demons can shapeshift into any animal, but once they reach puberty, of course, a demon settles into one animal form, and this form usually says something about the person's character. Lyra grew up believing she was an orphan, and the only family she knows is her uncle Lord Asriel, a powerful nobleman who is an adventurer and scholar, and sometimes comes to visit. In the beginning of the book, Lyra and her demon, Pantalaimon, are snooping around in Jordan College's private retiring room before one of her uncle's visits, when they see the master of the college pour something into a glass of wine meant for Lord Asriel. Once Lord Asriel and Lyra are alone in the room, she bursts out of her hiding place to warn him about the poisoned wine. Her uncle is angry at the intrusion, but asks her to stay hidden and spy on the master during his scientific presentation, which is all about Lord Asriel's recent exploration to the north, a mysterious substance called dust, and the discovery of a city in the sky. Lyra is fascinated by her uncle's presentation, and soon becomes obsessed with the idea of traveling to the north. However, she spends most of the first part of the book running wild in Oxford, making mischief and playing war with other scrappy children, always accompanied by her best friend Roger, the college's kitchen boy. Meanwhile, there are rumors of gobblers, a group of people who have been kidnapping children. We learn from a short scene with the narrator that the children are lured in by a glamorous woman named Mrs. Coulter, whose demon is a beautiful and cruel golden monkey. Soon, the gobblers are stealing children in Oxford, and Lyra is terrified to find out that her best friend Roger is missing. That night, the master of Jordan College invites Lyra to dinner with him and a special guest, Mrs. Coulter, who is also a scholar and high up in the church's inner circle. Lyra is entranced by the charming and beautiful lady and is thrilled when she offers to take Lyra on as her personal assistant on an expedition to the north. The night before she leaves with Mrs. Coulter, Lyra is woken up by a housekeeper and taken to a secret meeting with the master, who gives her a curious device called an alethiometer, which resembles a golden compass, and tells her to keep it secret. Lyra isn't sure who she can trust, but she promises to keep the device safe. Lyra goes off to live with Mrs. Coulter, and several weeks pass in a whirlwind of fancy parties, shopping trips, and brunches with her charming friends. Heyo, lucky her! 
Everything is wonderful until Pantalaemon realizes that they're never going to the north, and that Mrs. Coulter wants to keep Lyra as a kind of pet. Pan is also terrified of the Golden Monkey, who he believes is spying on them, and may have discovered Lyra's hidden alethiometer. Everything becomes clear one night at a cocktail party, when Lyra overhears a discussion about the organization Mrs. Coulter runs, the General Oblation Board, and realizes that they are the Gobblers. She also finds out that her uncle Azriel has been captured by Panzersbjorn, or Armored Bears, and is being held as a political prisoner in the north. Lyra and Pan escape the house and run into a family of Egyptians, traveling boat people that they knew from Oxford. The Egyptian family, led by Ma Costa, have lost a child to the gobblers and are determined to mount a rescue. Ma Costa takes Lyra to Egyptian roping, or gathering of clans, where she meets John Fa, the leader of the Egyptians, and Farder Koram, an old wise man. At the roping, Lyra learns that her uncle Azriel is actually her father, and that the horrible Mrs. Coulter is her mother. Lyra seems to be more special than she knows, and the Egyptians are determined to keep her safe and innocent of her destiny. The Egyptians organize a mission to the north to rescue the stolen children, while hiding Lyra from Mrs. Coulter and the police. On the journey north, Lyra begins to learn how to read the alethiometer with Fardacorum. The device has dozens of tiny symbols and three needles you can arrange, plus a fourth needle that swings around to symbols seemingly at random. Fardacorum tells Lyra that there were only six alethiometers ever made, and that the device can tell the truth if you know how to ask it. Along the way, Lyra meets lots of colorful characters, including the rogue armored bear York Burnison and the Texan balloonist Lee Scoresby. After an altercation in the town of Trollsund, Lyra helps Yorick get his armor back, and both he and Lee Scoresby join their expedition. As they near Bolvingar, the ominous location where the gobblers bring the children, Lyra keeps getting a strange reading from the alethiometer, telling her about a ghost in a nearby village. She and Yorick travel to the village to figure it out, and there they discover the horrifying results of the experiments in Bolvingar. The gobblers are severing children from their demons. In an abandoned shed, Lyra meets a little boy named Tony Makarios, who is alone and confused and devastated by the loss of his demon. She takes him back to the Egyptians, but he dies soon after. A whole lot of other wild stuff happens, including Lyra's capture and escape from Bolvangar, her joyful reunion with her best friend Roger, the destruction of that awful place, more information about the mysterious substance known as dust, a balloon ride to York Burnison's home Svalbard, a thrilling one-on-one -on -one combat between armored bears, and the discovery of Lord Asriel's plan to build a bridge to cross into the world in the sky. Lyra and Roger end up at Lord Asriel's prison compound in Svalbard, and while Lyra had believed all along that her purpose was to help free Lord Asriel, and even to help him on his mission, she finds out too late that they are not on the same side. Lord Asriel kidnaps Roger and tows him up the mountain, with the intention of using the massive burst of energy released by severing a child and his demon to tear open the sky and cross into the new world. Though Lyra and Yorick pursue him, they are sadly too late to save Roger, who dies instantly. Mrs. Coulter shows up, and Lyra overhears a strange conversation between her estranged parents as they try to reconcile their ideals and ambitions about dust and the church. The last scene is of Lord Asriel walking into the sky, with a furious and heartbroken Lyra and Pantalaimon following secretly behind. Wow. Mm. <laughs> so much happened in this book. I, I loved it. I was writing the summary and trying to remember it all and trying to make it as short as possible, and oh boy, there's a lot to get into. So yeah. why don't we talk about our feelings? I have a lot. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah. Um. This kind of... This went, like, all over the place for me. I felt like it was a thrilling adventure, but then I mm -hmm. was like, what the frig? Like, this is so dark to be a kid. It's so book. dark. And I find a lot of times, I, like, I can't watch a lot of kids' movies now that I'm an adult because they're depressing as shit, okay? And <laughs> this is so dark. I'm like, what is with people making kids' stuff so dark you know and they're like they won't understand it oh they will it sticks with you and then you turn into me okay like <laughs> it's so like, or me which <laughs> arguably could be worse <laughs> <laughs> but like it was 
it was a lot. It was a lot. And there was like graphic violence. There's deep theological discussions. There was like when she was in that weird school, was it in um In Bolvangar? Yes, Bolvangar. Um Bolvanger? Bolvanger? Bolvanger. <laughs> I, I don't know how to North say it. I've just been Abbey? saying it my own way. <laughs> when they were there, I was like, is this like World War II, like internment camps? Like what is happening mm. here? You know, because they were doing weird experiments on the kids. They were separating them. There was no information. Like, I don't know. There was a lot. There was a lot going on. I enjoyed it. But then I was also like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, like, this is a lot. Well, I think that's the the thing that makes this book so good is that he didn't really have to make up a lot to get the feelings, you know? It is exactly like World War II and being in an internment camp or a prisoner of war camp. They were doing awful things to children, to adults in those places, and all through this book there you can see very clearly direct ties to everything Mm -hmm. that has happened or even is currently going on in our world today Mm -hmm. and i thought that was while dark was very well done this is Mm -hmm. exactly the kind of book i would have liked to read as a kid (laughs) yeah and it is it is definitely dark and scary but as someone who read it as a kid i think it taught me a lot And it set up a lot of, um, not expectations necessarily, but it it teaches you to kind of grapple with dark things in your adulthood. And I don't have a child myself, so I, I don't know a lot about raising children, but it seems to me that it's good to expose your children to these kinds of difficult ideas when they're ready for them or when they're curious about the world and I I don't know I I feel like I'm not expressing myself very well but I think there's something to be said for dark issues in children's literature in children's media in general because the world is pretty dark Mm -hmm. and while it is a lot of times more pleasant to shield ourselves and I certainly am a tender-hearted person who doesn't like to think about these things a lot but it's still important and yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm not I'm not saying what I mean, but I do get it. Do you get it? Yes, I get <laughs> yeah. it. I think maybe I was overexposed as a child. Maybe I mm. was. It was too early. I don't know because this is bringing back like Brave Little Toaster. You remember that movie? Oh yeah. Anyone? I just saw that. Oh yeah. Come across Disney oh, Plus the other day, no. and I was like, Aaron, we can't watch this. It's too scary. Yeah. But maybe it's not. And then I told Scott that, my husband, I told I told him that, and he was like, it's just a kid's movie. And then I had to find this article where it explains just how messed it is. And he was like, oh, my God. And I'm like, yeah, this is for kids. I still think about it, and I get like a pan- – like, I will think of certain parts and start to panic, you know? And it's like, this is yeah. too much. I didn't feel That's quite... like how I feel about the small world ride at Disney. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> terror. Pure oh, terror. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Well, see, this did not, this was not as um, intense for me, but there are definitely moments where, like I said at the beginning of this episode, if I had read this as a kid, I think I would have been like panicking and what do I do? What do I do? Um, Yeah. And that's just a personal thing. I don't want to get too (laughs) deep into it. It's not that type of podcast. So (laughs) yeah, but I do think it was very well written. I do wonder sometimes how much and I think it's probably because I have never read anything else by him this is my only experience with Philip Pullman but I wonder what if he towed the line or if he crossed the line of putting his own opinions in the book versus just writing a very complex story you know Mm. um yeah you know I mean, mean, I think there's always a part of the author's own opinions in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if I can necessarily speak to that. I think you're right. I think there probably was a lot of his own personal opinions. Mm-hmm. Um, but is that a bad thing? I don't think it's bad, but I just, when I feel like it's the author talking and not the character, mm. 
That's what I Right, you don't like to feel um, lectured by it. Yeah, because there were a few very small moments where I felt like that, and I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. okay, weird. But most of it, I didn't feel like that, so it Mm -hmm. made sense. And I do think this book worked really well and was so intense and fast-paced because everything was high stakes from the get-go, which is great. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and I think um, what you're picking up on were those moments where he's kind of uh, giving his own personal opinions, I think were made better by the fact that it was um, not all narrated by Lyra. Yes. Like from the get go, you know that it's a kind of disembodied narrator. You see a couple scenes that aren't from Lyra's points of view, mm-hmm. but for the most part, you follow her, but it's not told by her. Yes. So I think that helps to make it work better is that you know that there's someone telling the story that. Uh, has their own ideas and their own um, ways of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Sorry, just quick thought on that point. I wonder who do you think is telling the story? Like if this was like mm. a Princess Bride situation where someone is reading the story to someone, like who would be reading this? I don't know. But I mm. never thought of it like that, but that makes a lot of sense. Like of what you said, Tilly. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the narrator. A question to ponder. Yeah. Whoever he intended for the narrator to be this, like, this, like, omnificent presence or whatever, it it was great. Loved it. (laughs) And I'll continue to enjoy it, I hope. One thing I really, really liked about this book, I never thought that I was going to get the same feelings that I had as uh, an adolescent person reading um a fantasy book for the first time Mm -hmm. again i never thought that i was going to feel the same feelings that i had reading narnia or like when i first started reading harry potter but i really felt that with this book and it was so nostalgic and heartwarming for me to read this and be able to have this brand new first experience as an adult and oh it made God. me excited to have a kid and be yeah. like <laughs> be able to read something like this to my kid and for them to experience that feeling for the first time as well. Oh my God, Nikki, that warms <laughs> my heart to hear you have that experience. I'm so jealous of you of being an adult and reading this for the first time and having all these thoughts. And I'm just so happy that that oh, that happened. Yeah, it's, it's great. Honestly, it's such a nice feeling. <laughs> One thing I book. wanted to talk about. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say what a book. Nikki's like, I feel so heartwarmed and like, I can't wait to read this to a child in the future. And I'm like, I was like, what? This is dark. <laughs> this is deep. This is... <laughs> I still enjoyed it. You know, it's just interesting the two different feelings. <laughs> Absolutely. I just uh, I hear a little meow coming from behind me oh there he is okay he's just beside me um one thing i wanted to talk about was demons and the idea of the demons in this book because that's something that as a kid i fully deeply desired my own demon uh, my own little animal companion who could shape shift and protect me and be there and give me advice and i really love that the way that um it's written this kind of concept and there was actually a quote i wanted to read um So it's on the way to the north when they're on this ship and Lyra is talking to this sailor named Jerry and they're talking about why demons settle into one form when they're teenagers. Sailor Jerry. Sailor Jerry. Oh, that's so true. I didn't even think about that. (laughs) So Lyra is kind of saying, I don't know why they have to settle. I want Pan to be able to shift all the time. I don't understand. And Jerry says, anyway, there's compensations for a settled form. And she asks, what are they? And he says, knowing what kind of person you are, take old Belisaria, who is his demon. She's a seagull, and that means I'm kind of a seagull too. I'm not grand and splendid nor beautiful, but I'm a tough old thing and I can survive anywhere and always find a bit of food and company. That's worth knowing, that is. And when your demon settles, you'll know what sort of person you are. And I remember reading that as a kid and thinking, I want to know what sort of person I am. I want to have that extra little bit of help. And I really love, too, the fact that the demons aren't just there to agree with the characters all the time. 
they really are kind of there to give advice and to have differing opinions. I think very early on, Pan disagrees with Lyra's decision to be hiding in the retiring room. Mm -hmm. She calls him a coward, and he says, <laughs> certainly I am a coward. What are you going to do about this? And she really, he really challenges her. So I just really love the concept of demons. I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts. Yeah, I I loved um, all the stuff with demons. And while they're contradicting... I think those are natural conversations you have in your, you being the, mm. the general you, have in your own mind while you're doing things. You're doing something as a child that you know is wrong and mm -hmm. you're nervous and you're kind of having that inner argument of, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And like, oh, but if it like works out, this is going to happen and it's going to be great. Like, just get over it. And you, so even though they're there kind of, um, as the devil's advocate or something sometimes that's just mm -hmm. a natural thing that happens in your head i really liked um even though maybe puberty isn't the time i would say now as a as a 25 year old um i didn't know shit about myself when i was <laughs> going through puberty and i still kind of don't so i don't yeah. know if the if their demon should settle that young but <laughs> but mm -hmm. i do like the idea that they as you find out what kind of person you are your demon settles into its kind of true form i also mm -hmm. think it's hilarious that mrs coulter's demon was a monkey because monkeys <laughs> are vicious little fucks so yes. that and totally checks out <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really, really loved the demons. I was reading it thinking like, oh, I want one. I wish that I would yeah. be cool. And I had my zoo around me, my two cats and dog. I call them the zoo. And I was like, oh, <laughs> they were right here. You know, I got three, I guess. That's how much I've got going on inside. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was just, I really loved it. And I, it was just so, I think Nikki was saying earlier in the episode how that part of the book really brought a tender um, mm -hmm. uh, touch to the narrative because, I mean, she's like 11 in this book, 11, mm -hmm. 12. And mm -hmm. I think she's 13 because later she says she's 11 because she's small. So she mm. lies about her age to make herself seem younger when she gets brought into Ballvanger. Oh, okay. Oh. I thought she was 12. I definitely saw on time. the internet that she was 11, but maybe people oh. are misunderstanding. Don't know. I have no idea, but I just It remember... was never stated in the book really clearly, so. I just remember thinking a lot of like, wow, she's really young for all this to happen or for like Mrs. Coulter to be like, "Can you help me with my research?" I'm like, if I asked a 12-year-old, "Can you take all these data things and this and that?" I'd be like, "Wow, this is a joke." You know, like <laughs> they are not writing down my notes, okay? You give them like a fake task so they feel important you know <laughs> right and i think that's probably what was happening with her yes but back to the demons i loved them i loved pan i loved the moment where they almost got separated and she was like i thought mm. you were leaving and he was like i would never you know i just thought, i know oh my God. so emotional and i want to know who do you think your demon would be because i don't know that is like who am i you know who are i who are we <laughs> oh but... I don't know. I feel like I would like someone else to tell me what my personal character would be. <laughs> I don't think I'm equipped to make the decision on my own. Right. Um, I've taken a lot of quizzes. There are a lot of quizzes out there. Of like, who would your demon be? Oh, really? And I, I think mine should... turned out to be a cat. Ooh. Um, a small cat. I we should um, find one and I'll do the same one. And then before the end of the episode, just say... Like, we should just do a little pause at some point and take, I'll take the quiz. And I'm Googling say. it. Okay, we're going to figure out what demon we would settle as. I'm so excited. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I've taken this particular quiz, so I'm hoping I'll get a different result. Just for variety. Ooh, I'm so... Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to go first? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nikki's like, yep. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my... My demon, apparently, according to the Epic Reads quiz, we'll link it in the description so you can also find out what your demon would be. Um, I would settle, my demon would settle as a Pomeranian. Oh, <laughs> it says, that makes so much sense. Right? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> it says, all demons are loyal. That's a given, considering they're the embodiment of one spirit. 
but your Pomeranian demon reflects how deeply you're connected to your inner spiritual self. You're an energetic, friendly person, usually at the forefront of trends. Oh, God, no. But you never let materialism cloud your judgment. Interesting. <laughs> I kind of see it. I don't think Can't it's off you? base. Right now? <laughs> Look at this cutie. <laughs> cutie. <laughs> Anyways, so apparently I'm a Pomeranian. I am yappy, I guess, so. <laughs> Nikki, what about you? Uh, I got a lynx. <gasps> Ooh. which i'm Ooh, very yes. happy with i love big cats <laughs> <laughs> yes um the lynx represents vision and foresight and having your demons settle as one would contemplate your ability oh complement your abilities to see through lies and deceptions you have a keen awareness of the world around you and how others perceive you you value the promises you make and care that those close to you believe that you are truly loyal to them Wow. I would agree. I think that makes sense too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a little wild card here. Mine would be a crested gecko. <gasps> Ooh. So apparently your gecko demon reflects your easygoing attitude. They symbolize the hope for growth and rebirth. And much like your demon, your mantra is to believe in tomorrow. Even when the days are hardest, you find the strength within yourself to persevere, usually through good hearted humor. Which yeah. I can see that for myself too. Yeah, At first yeah. I was like, ew, a gecko. And then I remembered I've met geckos and they're super cute they and also very convenient to just have around you all the time. Yeah. Like in Twist, or not Twisted, oh my God, Entangled, <laughs> Rapunzel's Pascal as a little chameleon. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So cute. Well, that was oh fun. God. Yeah. Great. I love that. Let us know what your demon is if you take the quiz. We would love to know. <laughs> I just think it's so much fun. <laughs> Oh my gosh, but moving right along. <laughs> I would like to talk a bit about um, the adaptations to film and TV that this uh. mo- that this book has had. <laughs> I've seen the movie um, a long time ago. I remember being very disappointed by it. Mm. Uh, I haven't seen the new TV series, but I'm very excited to because I think it's a sort of story that would work better as a longer limited series rather than as just a movie because there's so much to unpack. Yeah. I remember the movie being very glamorous, very like glitzy, but didn't really get a lot of the the heart and the um, complexity that I saw in Lyra. I didn't find really worked for me in the movie, but it's been a long time since I've seen it. I remember it not doing very well, though. I just remember the CGI polar bear. That's it. Like, I didn't yeah. see the movie, but yeah. I did see the movie. Um, I don't really remember. I just remember that Nicole Kidman yes. played, I'm assuming, Mrs. Mrs. Coulter. Coulter. Um, yep. Farter and <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> um, <laughs> I just got that. <laughs> but <laughs> I can't. Um, I just remember, you know, there are like two different roads fantasy movies go down. It's yep. either, like, Lord of the Rings, Harry mm. Potter, like, great understanding of the original text to create this yes. beautiful, all-encompassing world. And I think that really comes down to having, you have to have a perfect creative team to do that. You have yes. to have everybody who has the same artistic vision. If the costumes aren't good, if the set isn't done well all of those things ruin fantasy movies very easily Mm -hmm. and this was kind of like the new wrinkle in time movie i didn't watch it but i saw the um i saw the commercials for it and i was like oh that's gonna be a shitty movie you can just tell right away that things are gonna be a flop it doesn't matter how famous the people are Mm. or how experienced they are at acting there's just this special thing that you have to get on point to make a movie like that work and this was so far from that yeah (laughs) and let me just say i also think there's something to be said about using cgi and special effects and using practical effects there's a fine line between doing way too much cgi in my opinion and shitty cgi and you know just all that jazz but um like they're this is like news i guess topical or whatever um because they're making the sarah j mass series a court of thorns and roses into a tv show Mm -hmm. and 
I'm like, that's either going to be an amazing show that has a huge budget, it's going to be like Game of Thrones, or it's going to be shitty like Riverdale. I'm sorry if you watch Riverdale. I know it's not a fantasy series, but like, you know what I mean? It's going to be glossy. Mm -hmm. It's going to be not big enough budget put into the world building and to bring it to life. Like Lord of the Rings, that budget was crazy. They did so much practical effects and then CGI, you know, like to Mm -hmm. really make it real, like you could touch it, you know? Yeah. Where the commercials for the Golden Compass and for A Wrinkle in Time, eh, you know, it's glossy, it's fake, it's it's overproduced almost in a way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah, whereas like what you were saying, Tilly, there's some really complex things going on that they just kind of skipped over because they went for like this is a fun kids action movie which yeah yeah but no (laughs) yeah i think you um hit the nail on the head nikki when you're talking about everyone needs to have the same artistic vision yes because i like seeing movies that are based on books they don't have to be the same for me like i do see them as two separate kind of pieces of art they're adaptations they're not going to be the same Mm -hmm. and as long as there is a vision and there is um kind of a different take on it the movie I think could still be good even if it's different and not rooted in the text but I think as long as it takes away the same feelings and the same heart and the same um like emotion from the text even if it's different in the movie it could still be good but I just feel like the people who made this first movie, I forget when it came out, it was a while ago, they just didn't understand the book. And so like you were saying, Kelly, they made it kind of this like glossy kids movie, which it isn't. Mm-hmm. It, it should never be. And no. so I think that's maybe why it didn't work. Yeah, I, I um, because I didn't read the book when I was younger, but I did see the movie, I think seeing the movie made me not want to read the book because yeah. I wasn't really interested in this kind of nothing can go wrong atmosphere that the movie presented because you when you only have 2 hours yeah. to cram a whole I don't know how the I don't know how long the book is like the actual book but I read the book on my iPad and it was like 300 pages which is typically yeah, I think it's like about 3 400 pages Yeah I was going to say it's like my iPad's typically 50 to 75 pages less than the actual book. Hmm. Um, And so seeing the movie, I was like, I don't even want to, to read this book because I'm just Hmm. not interested in people just getting the right answers right away. Mm -hmm. And while I didn't feel like in the book, she was led astray very much. Um, I didn't feel like she was sitting there like searching for answers. I think because of the use of the alethiometer as a tool mm-hmm. to move the plot forward, it made sense mm-hmm. yeah. that she wasn't coming along all of those things because she had this extra insight into what was going on. And because she was the only person who was able to read it, she could do these things. Mm-hmm. And the whole point of the book, I think, is that she can do these things but she can't know yeah that she's doing it yeah she is going to help everybody or bring down the church or whatever but she can't know she's doing it along the way Mm -hmm. so i don't know the movie was just like whatever yeah i think (laughs) i'm glad that they didn't make any (laughs) more yeah (laughs) well i think another thing too that the movie probably missed having not seen it but just seeing the commercial Um, they probably missed the whole dynamic of which okay one of the things I thought Philip Pullman was really successful at was creating a story where there's a child as the main protagonist but he doesn't see her as a child you know Mm. because in real life there are adults who think kids are stupid or kids just don't know things or you, you know everything is going over their heads and then there's adults who are like no kids aren't dumb they understand things they just understand it in a different way so reading the book i felt he really understood that because there's some really complex things happening and um not to jump forward or anything but at the very end when she says to pan both mrs coulter and lord asriel don't or they think dust is bad so it must be good you know the the way that she can put that together in her mind 
she's not dumb you know what i mean kids aren't stupid they understand things and so i think sometimes when we make these glossy movies that cut out the complexities that you get to see in the book get to read in the book Mm -hmm. We just have a fun adventure with a girl and a polar bear, you know? Right. But it's so much more than that. (laughs) I wonder, Absolutely. if um, them cutting those things out of the movie, like, I haven't watched the movie um, recently. If I had finished the book yesterday, I probably would have watched it last night to have a little Mm. bit um, more, like, interesting things to say (laughs) during this part. But... um, You're saying plenty interesting. Yeah. Oh, thank you. (laughs) If they did cut a lot of this, like, theological talk out of the movie, um, I wonder if they did that specifically to bring in more audiences because a lot of people were not interested in going to see the movie because they were uncomfortable with their kids reading these. Mm -hmm. It was such a blatant smackdown to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Um, And while I, when reading it, I thought about if I had read it when I was younger, um, I actively went to church until I was um, in grade nine, I guess. And I went to Sunday school and all that kind of stuff. So I have a pretty good understanding of the things that um, they talk about in the book from the, like, a Catholic's perspective. And when I think about my kid reading this book, I think... I am, I would be uncomfortable with them reading it without me really talking to them about what is actually being said, because these are a lot of really heavy handed claims coming down, but they're more so directed on people of the church, Mm -hmm. not the church itself. Yeah. And I think that's something to really think about is because when you read the Bible, the Bible is not inherently bad. There are a lot of really great things in the Bible, like... Mm -hmm don't cast the first stone, you know, just basic things to live by of like accepting other people. If people are not doing you wrong, do not do wrong to them and all of that kind of stuff. But the way that men or man in the general sense being humankind uh, tends to portray the Bible, especially in um, like Roman, Catholic, um, Anglican, Baptist, um, like teachings is kind of backwards to what the actual Bible is saying. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about my kid reading it, I would definitely, I definitely want them to read it. I think it's an amazing book, but I don't think it's a book for them to read on their own and not have a discussion about what those things actually mean. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that just opens up a whole other can of worms into kind of, Um, hate for a religion that they're not even really understanding why those things are happening Mm -hmm. or why these things are being said Mm -hmm. and I think that would go no matter what religion this was talking about Mm -hmm. we see it a lot with a lot of religions that aren't uh, predominantly white based where white people look at them and say that's bad that's not good because it's not my religion Mm -hmm. now if yeah Exactly. So I think that this is just a prime example of that happening to a religion that's not used to that being put on them. Mm -hmm. And I think that while it is not Philip Pullman's responsibility to do anything about that, this is his book and people can read it or not read it if they want to. I think that it is, I'm going to say parents' responsibilities because this is a book intended for children um intended for children um that it is the parents responsibilities to have those kinds of harder conversations with their children so they actually understand what they're reading about and they're not leaving just going are you catholic you suck or whatever like i don't know because kids are crazy and like you never know and not just kids anybody you never know what somebody's really going to hone in on with something but because this is directed at children mainly it is a a guardian's responsibility to make sure that they're fully understanding what is actually being said Mm -hmm. and what the message really is yeah i agree with that absolutely i do too and i think so much of the book does talk about 
the people and how people can misinterpret or interpret to suit their needs or twist words um, to see what they want to see. And I think that's so much of what makes Mrs. Coulter and the rest of the General Oblation Board evil is because they're taking certain things out of their teachings and saying this is what it means and this is why we it's bad. And I think that's a really important distinction and that is kind of what's um, I think driving uh, the negativity. Um, I think that's what people uh, react to in this book is that they are he's putting it on blast mm -hmm. right he's he's making the point that this is bad you shouldn't be reading their bible and interpreting what you want and only applying it to certain people because it serves you yes mm -hmm. yeah exactly and a side note because you brought it up and i was like oh yes i made a note on this or uh, about this on my kobo the general oblation board g-o-b mm -hmm gob blurs mm -hmm. gob yeah yeah they talk about that in the book oh they yeah. do yeah <laughs> they're like that's where it comes from i guess because <laughs> i thought it was like child snatchers they're gobbling them up right and then i was like g o b yeah. gobbler gobbler <laughs> wow okay great. you cracked it you cracked I think the code i needed a parent to read this book with me because i <laughs> It is a sort of book that you do need to read, like, a few times to fully kind of understand all the ins and outs of everything. Well, and I was flipping between um, audiobook, which was, like, a radio play version, and then the ebook. So it was a different experience. I really enjoyed the audiobook, though. I thought it was fantastic. I should listen to it. It was very It was good. amazing, yeah. Tilly. It was so good. It, yeah. It I don't typically so reach for audiobooks, but I think I would like it if it's a book I've already read before and I'm more familiar mm -hmm. with. I think I'm just not so good at taking in um, the, like, oral storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not either. And I was, I was like, oh, kind of like out of necessity reaching for the audiobook yeah. because of the time constraint in which we're yeah. reading the book to do the episode. But I, because it's, um, I don't know if it is BBC Radio that did it, but it is done like a BBC Radio series where it's mm. a full cast There's and music. a narrator. And yeah, it's... Oh, wow. It was just all encompassing i have uh, a whole bunch of cds from back in the day that are uh all the narnia books read as mm. a bbc radio series and that also made me think of <laughs> think of narnia while doing this while reading this book because they're they have like the full cast all the kids voices and everything it was just so nice it was very immersive mm-hmm you just get a coloring book out and you just have a chill time while you listen to this awesome story. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> I do have to say one little thing that kind of bugged me, and I think it wouldn't have bothered me if I was a kid reading it. The amount of times that I read or heard that Lyra fell asleep and then woke up, I was like, I don't care, you know? <laughs> I don't care. Oh, that interesting. She fell that didn't even stick out to me at all. <laughs> But it's because I was hearing it, right? So I was like, she fell asleep. Yeah. And then when she woke up, this happened. And then she fell asleep. And then someone woke her up. I was like, great. She sleeps. We get it. What about, did she go to the bathroom? You know? Like, <laughs> I don't need to hear that, you know? <laughs> this is a minor, very small thing. I was like, what? But. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't pick up on that either. But. <laughs> I did. I did. But I, yeah, I made a note of it. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of one more thing that I wanted to talk about when we were talking about like interpreting the Bible and all that and mm -hmm. I don't know if we can like go back to that for a yeah, moment just because yeah. it occurred to me um but the whole idea of dust throughout the whole series the whole book is that no one really knows what's going on they've had some pictures of it it's this mysterious substance that they've just kind of discovered and at the very end of this book Lord Azrael talks to Lyra and tells her that um, the General Oblation Board and the Magisterium in general were afraid of this new scientific discovery. They were afraid of not knowing what it was. And so they decided that it must be the embodiment of all original sin. And so they just leap to this conclusion with very little knowledge, and they assume that it's bad. And so that's why 
everyone's doing all these experiments is to stop you know, people from being exposed to dust because the idea is that dust is attracted to people who are adults, but it's um, not present in children or it's not attracted to children. And so they assume, well, we must, you know, go to the source and separate the demons because it's got to be original sin. It's got to be puberty. It's got to be sexuality. It's got to be all this Mm -hmm. stuff. And that I didn't really understand as a kid. I didn't really understand all the implications of that. And reading it on this reread, I, I, must have known that that's what the kind of conclusion is, is that it's original sin, but it was occurring to me way earlier. Like, I was seeing the signs of it. Oh, yeah. And it just really hammered home this idea of people are afraid of something they don't understand, and so they decide to apply it to something from their teachings and say that it's bad and that they're just protecting the children. Yeah. And that's something we see so often in our own world, and... Phil Pullman really put that magnifying lens onto that, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, I I was really, um, I don't know if surprised is the right word, but I'm going to say surprised by mm-hmm. the conversation around that at the end where he um, talks about the story of Adam and Eve, which is very similar to the actual story of Adam and Eve in the Bible. Eve um, talks to the snake, the snake Uh, proceeds to encourage her to eat the apple off the tree even though God has told them that they cannot eat the fruit from this tree or else it will kind of ruin everything all of this stuff ensues but then also when he was talking about how they would castrate male sopranos and cult and like do that kind of things to young boys to keep them singing high for church purposes in the choir and everything. And I was just like, wow, that, I don't know why it was that specific thing to me, but that really raised it to being not a child's book anymore. (laughs) I don't know, just that specific um, analogy and how it was said so um, abruptly and kind of bluntly. And I don't know how I would have reacted to that reading it as a child, I don't know, you read it as a child, Tilly, so maybe when you're a kid and you read that, you don't really understand what that No, means. I didn't understand it. I just kind of skipped over it as like, oh, you know, whatever. Yeah, but like that's real and that used to happen often and stuff. That's, yep. oh, it's just crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I really enjoyed this book and I enjoyed reading it knowing all of the tiebacks to um like Catholicism and everything like that. Mm-hmm. I thought that that if I didn't have those ties, I maybe wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. But because I was able to make all of those connections, I really felt for these characters a lot more. Yeah, I could totally see that. Like I don't really have any connection to any church really, so I understood some of it in terms of that sort of thing or background but um yeah when it got to the part where they were talking about castration i was like oh oh here we go here we go like (laughs) this is this is very uh mature for a kid's book you know which is fine it's just i was like whoa you know like they're not gonna get this part um but yeah i mean things not castration but other things are still happening in religions around the world today and in canada and in america you know there's still things like that happening not uh not to say like castration necessarily but other things you know so yeah i don't know it's very interesting there's a lot to (laughs) no pun intended dissect there so (laughs) oh my god (laughs) there's a lot to get into yeah for it. I thought the ending with Lord Asriel and Mrs. Coulter was like so dramatic like in the snow yeah. like maximum yes, drama like, oh my god yeah and the audiobook really oh, highlighted the drama oh. I was like what is going on it was like on? Casablanca I was like if we leave together I we know. leave now we sail for the dust and if we don't I never see you again <laughs> and I was like oh my like I, as God I is know. my witness I'll never go hungry again like it was like this very like <laughs> I was I was literally picturing like um that like frankly yes. my dear I don't give a damn and like them like yeah. kissing and stuff and I was like what 
this even I happen? Know, and she's just <laughs> watching her estranged parents like making out and being like, let's go ruin the world together. And she's like, but I can't. I can't. And he's like, you must, you know? And then they don't. Yeah. <laughs> And then, like, the demons, they're, like, kind of mimicking yeah. this weird encounter. And I I was feeling weird about the human's encounter. And then I was, like, kind of disgusted while reading about the demon's yeah. encounter. Um, not because they're animals, just seeing because the demons are their, like, purest form yeah. And what they're really feeling in those moments. And I was just like, mm-hmm. I felt, it felt dirty. Yeah. And like, a private moment nobody should see. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. and also the fact that his demon was like, they said, I don't remember the exact wording, but they said like, it was gripping the monkey very um, aggressively and almost like menacingly. And then mm-hmm. the monkey was like, <laughs> like, so to- two different Swooning, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i was really struck on this reread about the different tracks that we're following in the story that there's so many things happening but we're only really following lyra but lord asriel and mrs coulter have their own kind of history and their own narrative that we only get glimpses of part way through and then it really comes to a head at the end i think where you kind of get the sense of like they really did have this strange love affair they're two like ambitious people who are kind of like ruining the world in different ways and i was really interested in seeing that scene because it's the first time we see them um talk Mm -hmm. to each other or the first time that lyra sees it and it really made me wish for more um background on their relationship because it was so confusing. This wasn't a part that I was very interested in as a kid. You know, you're obviously like reeling from Lyra's um, seeing Roger dying. It's really traumatic and really awful. And so I don't really remember focusing on the strange conversation, but it is strange and it does make me wonder about their story. And I don't think that's ever something that Philip Pullman has revisited. I know he's written a couple of novellas about other characters and there's another series happening Right now, he's still in the middle of publishing. He's published the first two books that are kind of like a prequel and then a sequel to the end of the His Dark Materials that follow Lyra. Um, But I don't really think there's been a lot of focus on Mrs. Coulter and Lord Asriel. You just get the sense that there's like all this inner workings happening in the background that you don't even get to see. And I was really interested in this time around. Well, that moment is the first where you see both of them truly let their walls down and be vulnerable. So I think that's why it's so compelling because you're like, oh, this here are the inner workings because they're both putting on some kind of facade for Lyra because they want something from her. Right. And they want. They're, yep. you know, they can't show their, their hand yet, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I was, through the first part of the book, really hoping that when Lyra and Lord Asriel came together at the end, that there would be this bonding moment mm-hmm. between them where it would really symbolize that he is her father and all of this stuff. Um, I... I understand, or I was not surprised that that did not happen. Um, but I I really wish that he would have ended up being good. I don't yeah. know. There, there was just something about the way that their relationship was written at the beginning that really left a lot of room for interpretation and hope. Yeah. For the mm-hmm. end, because it really did seem that he was writing all of these things just to, or like Philip Pullman was writing all of these things of how their relationship is. And you really only see that through um, them conversing at the beginning. But mm-hmm. I really got the feeling that they were, um, that he did have feelings in his heart for her. Mm-hmm. And at the end, you you kind of see that he he didn't really at all he was just like yeah whatever you were yeah. like just a like a means to an end or just an accident yep. you were you're a blip and it it just so happened that i i had to see you every once in a while because you you live where i work yeah. and i i don't necessarily have good or bad feelings about that now but i was just hoping that there would be some kind of like familial caring at the end. 
I That's know, because Lyra <laughs> deserved it. Like, yeah. she had traveled so far, and she thought that she was doing the right thing by helping mm-hmm. him. And he was, like, he betrays mm-hmm. her, and it's so it's so hard it's so hard to read well and yeah and you go through the whole book being like oh she's going to take the alethiometer to lord asriel and then Mm -hmm. and everything will be fine some Mm -hmm. someone i don't remember who it is says well did the master tell you to take the alethiometer to lord asriel and and she's like yes (laughs) and then she's like well no and he's like yeah Mm -hmm. and she's like well fuck well even if you think (laughs) about his discussion with mrs coulter I don't know if he is really capable of loving someone, if Lord Azrael is capable mm-hmm. or if he has ever loved someone, like properly loved someone, because with Lyra, she's a means to an end. With Mrs. Coulter, it's like, either come with me or I'll never see you again and you're dead to me. It's just passion. Yeah, like, yeah. whoa, whoa, dude. It, it that That's not love. That's not either you come with me now or you're dead to me. Great. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Good talk. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Bye, bitch. You know? So. <laughs> Me to him, not him to her. Because, I mean, yeah. But anyways. <laughs> yeah. He. <sighs> yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. But I am glad Lyra gave him a piece of her mind. Was like, I did all this for you. We were rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if there's anything you can say about Lyra, it's that she mm. speaks her mind. Mm-hmm. I love Yorick Bernison. I loved him as a kid. I love him now. I remember being confused about their relationship as a child. Mm. I I didn't have a very good understanding of like love, I guess, or or I guess I thought love was always like a romantic love oh. in this context. So every time she would talk about loving Yorick, I was like, in a Ew. romantic way, does she think he's her boyfriend? Like, what's going on? So I remember feeling a little weird about that just because I didn't understand. But reading it now, I really did understand that she loved him. She admired him. He was like almost like a father figure to her. And there's this really lovely passage where I think Lee Scoresby is talking about like, who knows what bears feel, but if a bear ever loved a human, he loves Lyra. And I was like, oh my God, my heart. Uh, yeah. I really liked it. Yeah. I really liked all the bear, like the polar bear stuff and yeah. her tricking. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, Yoffer. I can't. Yeah. Like for Rackneson, the, the king yes. of the bears. Yeah. When Lyra tricks Yoffer into being um like fighting Yorick and everything like that and she thinks back on something someone told her about how you can't trick a bear and she said but he wants to be a human I have mm-hmm. and quote. so he will be trickable yeah, I have the quote right oh here. good you could not trick a bear but as Lyra had shown him Yoffer did not want to be a bear he wanted to be a man and Yorick was tricking him loved it yeah (laughs) yeah yeah that was really great i really liked all of that stuff i'm not usually a huge one for like action scenes but i was so attached to all of these characters and what was happening that i was even really entranced with the action that was going on the polar bear Mm -hmm. fight scene was so intense i was like oh my god i wrote a note saying is this the prophecy like where she betrays someone because she said oh my gosh i'm sending him into battle without his full armor and he has no idea and he's tired and he's hungry and i was like oh my god is he gonna die and so when they were fighting i highlighted the bit at the end when he wins because it was so intense mm-hmm. and when he like slices open the rib cage and eats the heart because that's tradition yeah <gasps> you know so gross for me but i'm not a bear so you know good for you that's yeah. you're right you're right <laughs> I'm about a vegetarian that. so i was like oh my god yeah but um it was just so well done like the action was so polar opposite oh, <laughs> i see what you did there <laughs> i see Anyway. Oh, I'm so sorry. Continue. <laughs> no, but I was just, I just, I really loved them. And the action sequences were so well done, so well written. And I really was really scared that he was going to die in the fight. And that that was the prophecy of who she betrayed. And then it was Roger, which I was so sad. I know. Yeah. God, I could talk about this book for hours and hours. But yeah. I feel as though we should probably try to wrap things up yeah. a little bit so maybe we'll go into favorite quotes or favorite parts 
Sure. Um, I can start us off because I have a couple I want to read, and this one I just really loved. So this is talking about Lyra's education at Jordan College. So she was raised with all these scholars. She thought she was an orphan. They weren't really good at taking care of her. She was always, like, running around and doing her own thing. So these scholars were not particularly good at taking care of Lyra. They were, you know, focused on their work and she was kind of allowed to run loose. So this is talking about uh, her piecemeal learning. Lyra's knowledge had great gaps in it, like a map of the world largely eaten by mice, for at Jordan they had taught her in a piecemeal and disconnected way. A junior scholar would be detailed to catch her and instruct her in such and such, and the lessons would continue for a sullen week or so until she forgot to turn up to the scholar's relief. Or else a scholar would forget what he was supposed to teach her and drill her at great length about the subject of his current research, whatever that happened to be. It was no wonder her knowledge was patchy. She knew about atoms and elementary particles and ambromagnetic charges and the four fundamental forces and other bits and pieces of experimental theology, but nothing about the solar system. (laughs) So I really love this image of these, like, reluctant, like, kind of spacey scholars just grabbing her and trying to teach her things. But beyond that, I also think it, she, it means that she's set up as a character with lots of different useful knowledge, but she's still kind of this young and innocent child. So I really, I really love this description of her. I think she is such a well-developed character and such a clear, I have such a clear picture of her. Cool. You had another one, Yeah, right? I like that part, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have, I'll let you guys talk about quotes and then I'll, I'll read a different one afterwards. Uh, I can just read a million quotes, so I'll let you guys go next. <laughs> I actually don't have any. Oh, okay. <laughs> just because I listened to the audiobook, so, sure. and I was at work for most of it, so I didn't highlight anything, but I loved many parts. Yeah. I will leave it at that. <laughs> okay, well, I have a quote. Great. Um, this yeah. is in part three. I'm not sure which chapter, but it is when... Oh, it's the man in the prison. So they're talking about, I yeah, they're name. talking about dust, and this is right before she's trying to get info about um, the king. And mm-hmm. she says to him, "You could teach me about bears, all right, them, all right, and we could sort of practice on that and work up to dust, maybe." And then he says, "Yes, yes, I believe you're right." There is a correspondence between the microcosm and the macrocosm. The stars are a live child. Did you know that? Everything out there is alive, and there are grand purposes abroad. The universe is full of intentions, you know. Everything happens for a purpose. And I just thought that's so sweet, and I think that is a very important principle and idea, and I that's something that I personally subscribe to, no matter what you believe or don't believe in I do believe in interconnectivity and you know the micro is the macro and all that Mm -hmm. jazz so (laughs) I just thought that was really nice and yeah that is lovely and it kind of ties in well with the the next quote I wanted to read which is from Serafina Pakala who is kind of a minor character in this book but she becomes more of a character in the next two she becomes developed more the witches do in general so I really, um, I really loved hearing a little bit about them, and I think this was a really beautiful section about it. So um, she's flying beside the hot air balloon that's taking them to Svalbard and to um, York's home of all the polar bears, the armored bears. And Lyra asks, aren't you cold? Because Serafina Fakala can... Um, like she isn't wearing furs or anything she's wearing like scraps of silk or something and all the witches are bare armed and like powerful and so she says we feel cold but we don't mind it because we will not come to harm and if we wrapped up against the cold we wouldn't feel other things like the bright tingle of the stars or the music of the aurora or best of all the silky feeling of moonlight on our skin it's worth being cold for that and it's just such a like beautiful idea of the witches and it gives you such a good look into who they are and their kind of like mentality and I just really loved it well now I have to see the northern lights aurora borealis like wow I've seen it once there was a very very cold night it was here in our hometown and it was a very cold night I was outside of the city and I looked up and I saw one single ribbon of green Oh, it was so, so magical. Nice. Good news. Yeah. No. 
Wow. (laughs) But I would love to see it in somewhere where you could see it better. Yeah. Maybe 2022. (laughs) I think this book was actually um, the American version is called Northern Lights. Oh. Yes. Yeah. I saw... I saw just looking it up on something. I was Googling things as I read. um, And one of them was like Northern Lights and Imbracus, also known as the Golden Compass. And I was like, who knows it as the Northern Lights? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Freaking American. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But Kate, very quick question. Is this, I never even thought about this, but whose dark materials are we talking about? Is it Lord Asriel's? Is it the general his, like the universe? Is it I have God's, an his? extremely good quote for this because the epigraph of the book is a line from Paradise Lost oh, by John Milton. Right. And it says his dark material. So I actually wrote it down because I was interested and I'd never noticed it before. So it's an excerpt from Paradise Lost and it says, Into this wild abyss, the womb of nature and perhaps her grave of neither sea nor shore nor air nor fire, but all these in their pregnant causes mixed confusedly in which thus must ever fight unless the almighty maker them ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss, the wary fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while, pondering his voyage. So... I see it as being kind of a reference to destiny and being like gods, pawns, and also there's the battle of the elements and the good and evil and also creating new worlds. Mm. That's my vague understanding of the title of the series, but I'd never known that before. I hadn't noticed that there was that epigraph before. Interesting. Ooh. Yeah. Interesting. See, maybe I will continue the series with like a little break. Because I didn't mm-hmm. know what I was getting into, and now I do. Because like I said, it's not like I didn't enjoy it, but I was like, oh, you know? <laughs> I really enjoyed talking about this book with you, too. I felt yeah. like we had some really great discussions, and I'm, I'm glad that we're all reading it as an adult, because I really do feel like, as a children's book, it's great. You take a lot from it. Mostly I wanted a demon and a lithiometer for myself, <laughs> but I think as an adult, it's so much richer. Well... And yeah. the alethiometer is, like, spiritual in nature in itself because, you know, mm-hmm. like, it's just, like, she just asks herself a question and it the answer appears, you know? So that's why I was like, hmm, secular book, but is it, you know? <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the BYOB podcast. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more from us, you can head over to our social media accounts to keep up to date on all things BYOB. Stay tuned after this to hear the first line of our next read from Blood and Ash, a new fantasy romance by Jennifer L. Armentrout. See you next time, and until then, keep on drinking in great stories. Cheers! Next time on BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book podcast. They found Finley this eve, just outside the Blood Forest, dead. (laughs) 